hello everyone. It's great to, great to be here and thanks for coming out. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this report uh, and I think firstly I just want to say that I'm not a climate scientist and you can see, see that from, from the training. Um, so why am I talking about it? Well, uh, last November, you may remember, this report was released. Uh, and it's a very, it's uh, the National Climate Assessment Report, it's volume two, it's comprehensive, authoritative, and it basically looks at the impacts of climate change on the United States. So that was released in November, and then I was looking for a topic for an undergraduate seminar course to be taught in the spring. Uh, and I felt that this is a topic that is of sufficiently pressing and widespread interest that the students would be interested in it. So I focused the seminar on the report. And what I'm going to do today is summarize some of that material. Hopefully it's not too much of a summary. I have a little worry that it might be, but we'll try to break that up if we can. Um, I'll also kind of introduce some other material and, uh, uh, that are more specific to Knoxville, for instance, um, and some other findings separate from that report. So we're going to look at the observed and predicted impacts of climate change on the United States, but we're going to focus mostly on the southeast and a little bit on East Tennessee and Knoxville. Okay. Where do these things come from? These are government reports, and they date back to 2000, which was the first of these reports. They were required, the, the, the government introduced them as a bill to, to produce these required reports every four years. Well, you can see we're a little bit off schedule, but the first was 2000, the second in 2009, 2014, and then the fourth. Okay, now the fourth has two volumes. Volume one, which focuses on the causes of climate change, and volume two, that's the one that we're going to look at, which was the most recent. This one came out before volume two, and that looks at the impact. So we're not really going to be talking a lot about the causes. We're going to look at the impacts. Okay. Where did the report come from? Uh, a lot of work. Um, approximately a thousand people, um, about 300 leading scientists split halfway between government and academia universities. The lead administrative agency was this agency, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration. But, but, and this is the big but, all of these agencies were also involved. That's why it's authoritative and comprehensive. Department of Commerce, Department of Defense, Energy, you name it, they're all there. Uh, they all had input. I can't imagine being the editor for such a report and having to deal with all the amount of feedback from these different <laughs> folks represented. It's, just imagine the Word document with all those uh, comments. It would uh, drive you crazy. Um, <clears throat> and of course, it did go through a multiple uh, peer reviews, both internal and external, to the government. And then, as I mentioned before, it was finally published in November, both in print format, basically a downloadable PDF, and an interactive website. And I'll kind of give you the link to that in a little bit at the end, actually. Uh, the actual formal title of the report is Risks and Adaption in the United States. And this concept of adaption is widely used in the, uh, in the report because, as you'll see, as we kind of move forward, and I'm sure as many of you appreciate and realize that it's happening and there's no way we can stop it. And so we have to adapt. And uh, how do you adapt? It's about changing how you put in your infrastructure, changing how you do a lot of things. So uh, that's a large part of this. So what's in the report? Um, well, as I mentioned, it focuses on the impacts, the risks, and adaption. Uh, the idea is to try to identify risks for decision makers. Uh, 
and how to avoid or reduce those risks. This is a kind of a br brief overview of the structure of the report. It's got your front matter, your summary findings, a little bit of an overview. Then it has this chapter here, which is a very long chapter, and it's a, called Our Changing Climate. It's a summary of some of the things that are happening. Uh, it has 10 key points, which we'll kind of go over. Then there are a series of topic chapters. They deal with everything. I've just covered water, energy, forests, agriculture, all of those major industries and concepts uh, are in there. And when we did this as a seminar for the students, the students would pick one of these chapters as a group and present the results to, uh, uh, to the class. So I'm going to summarize this chapter, and then I'm going to switch to the Southeast Regional chapter. So there's each region of the country, is, which is divided up, has a chapter, and of course we're most interested in the Southeast, and then all of the other background information. So here's where we are in terms of the divisions of the report and Tennessee, which we're sort of living in and interested in at this point, is in the southeast. This is the region of delineation, and uh, we're going to focus mostly on that. Okay. So, and before we kind of get into the findings, I need to kind of introduce this thing called the representative concentration pathway, RCP. The reason that I need to introduce this to you is it's basically what drives all of the models for prediction of climate change. So the RCP is basically driven by this radiative forcing term. Basically what that is is a balance in energy in terms of what's coming from the sun and what's sent back out from the earth. And when you see a positive here, that means that there's a net capture of the energy. If it's just equal to, you know, everything is equal uh, to what comes in and what goes out, there's, there's no sign. And then if we, cap, if we uh, lose more, then it would be negative. So basically to do the modeling, scientists set up these um, concentration pathways. And there are four of them. They're kind of illustrated here. And they're based on the radiative forcing values at 2100. Seems a long way in the future, but it's not that far. So this is the RCP 2.6 that's got a radiative forcing of 2.6 watts per meter squared and so on. And those fixed values then come back down in terms of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere because it's the CO2 that basically alters this balance of the energy. And by changing this balance, you have a fixed pathway of the CO2 to, uh, in the atmosphere to get to that point. We're going to look at these, and we'll say a little bit more of them as we move forward, because they're used to drive the modeling. <clears throat> so all four of those pathways are possible, depending on how we handle our greenhouse gases. This is the most optimistic, RCP 2.6, and it assumes that global annual greenhouse gases are peaking in this period. We are now 2020, and so this is essentially a redundant pathway, as you'll see, because they haven't peaked. The next one, which is now called the lower scenario, is RCP 4.5, and that predicts a peak at 2040. That's probably our most optimistic at this point, but it still only gives us 20 years. That ain't long, okay? RCP6, emissions peak at 2080. And then the most extreme scenario, there's no peak. We just keep putting out the emissions all the way through this century, all the way to 2100. And that's called the highest scenario. Sometimes you'll see that referred to as the highest scenario in some of the the graphs. Okay. You're probably wondering, uh, is that 2100, 
you know, where is that? Well, in the class that I was teaching, which was an upper level undergrad course, I wanted to get the class birth years, and that's the distribution of them. So if you then use those dates, you can calculate for the students an average birth year of 1996. That means their average age in the class was 23. CDC says the average life expectancy is 78.6. That means for the students in my class, and just as a reminder to those of you that are wrong side of 60, uh, <coughs> 2100 is not that far off because for our students now, they're going to be on average passing away in 2075, but that's on average. Many of them are going to be living to 2100. And so it's not that far in the future. And really, it's our students now that are going to be having to deal with these issues and these impacts. So it's really important that they take the lead in try to pushing for the, the changes that we need. OK. So this is that chapter two, our changing climate. And I'm going to go through these 10 key messages. And I'll have a little bit of an illustration of each message. I think many of them won't be new to you, but hopefully it'll reinforce their importance. So the first one, basically what we see in the climate is rapid change. And I should say that the wording I'm showing here is essentially what comes from the report. Rapid change but it's much more rapid than the pace of natural variations that have occurred in Earth's history. Since 1900 or 1901, the global temperatures increased 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And 16 of the last 17 years have been the warmest recorded by human observations. And we're well on track for this year to go in there, so it'll be 17 of 18. And there's no credible natural explanation for this amount of warming. Instead, all of the evidence points to human activity, specifically greenhouse gases. OK. Now, modelers. When you're doing, you know, I'm amazed at these, um, these modelers for the earthquake, uh, excuse me, for the hurricane trajectory. It's been amazing, you know, coming across, barreling across to the US, you know, if you were just to do a linear ex uh, kind of extrapolation, you would think it would hit the US. But they predicted that it was going to go north, and it did. The reason that they can do that is they have existing data sets that they sort of test their models on. And that's what's showing here. What we've got is the real temperature here observed. And this is a temperature difference from pre-industrial values. So that's why it's in, in uh, zero at this base. And the black line shows the actual temperature variations. And then the orange here is the predictions from the climate models. And the variability around those predictions is hatched. And those climate models are based on all drivers for, for um, these predictions. What I'm going to do is split it out into natural drivers and human drivers. So this is the natural. And what this shows is if you hold all of the other drivers constant and simply look at the effects of volcanic, you can see that's the green. That's what it's predicting in the terms of the temperature if you just allow for the variations in volcanic activity. Likewise, variations in solar fluxes and orbital effects, these are the effects of, on temperature that you would predict. If you sum all those, you get the sum of all the natural drivers. And that's the yellow with the shading. There is a bit of a pop up here, but not much. Yeah? Is it appropriate to ask a question? Um, sure. What's the orbital effect? When you talk yeah. about the position of the Earth relative to its, to its orbit evolutions, in, 
I'm, I'm, I'm not talking, I, I, I don't want to get into the details of the effects of the orbital, that's just in the report, this is just, so I'm, I'm not, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's variations in the orbit of the Earth that might, yeah, yeah. And I'm not sufficiently, uh, you know, not sufficiently um, into it to, to know the details of that. I want now to switch to the human drivers, and that's kind of interesting. They've also got three, ozone, land cover, and aerosols, changes in land cover. And so <coughs> CO2, or greenhouse gases, is up here. So there are four. And then if you sum these, the brown, the green, the orange, and the purple, you get the, um, some of the uh, drivers. And so the human drivers are being very, it's kind of quite interesting. It's being balanced off between the greenhouse gases and this aerosols, which is decreasing. It's a really weird thing, but having air pollution is actually good for the planet. Uh, if we had more air pollution, it had helped balance off these greenhouse gases in terms of particulates and stuff. It's terrible for your health, but it, it basically, in fact, this, although you don't really see it here, this little peak here has actually been speculated that at that time, which was in the 40s, there was a growth in the greenhouse gases, and there was um, a corresponding, it wasn't until these aerosols started to decline here that this decrease really started to come about from that. So that people speculate that that's actually a greenhouse gas effect, but it was kind of not modeled well because of the, uh, the aerosols. After the 70s, the aerosols come out. Basically, they're dropping out because we made a lot of clean air um, legislation. Okay. So the first point of this, the first key point, is that all of these uh, drivers, and primarily the greenhouse gases balanced by the aerosols, are what's causing this change. So future changes based on those RCPs, how much climate change we get is going to depend a lot on the greenhouse gases because we've got the emissions the, the aerosols down. Unless we start putting more aerosols in, that's not going to affect it that much. So with significant reductions, we could limit the increase to 3.6. Without significant reductions, annual average global temperatures could increase by 9 degrees or more by the end of the century. That's a lot. And this is the projections from those RCPs. So what this is, is carbon emissions from 1900 to 2100. The black is actual emissions measured. And then these are the projections based on those RCPs, that, the modeling RCPs. And this is the 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. The third one isn't shown here. I think what you could see, maybe you can't see that at the back, but the actual observations right now are following the red. Both this track, which is our best bet at this point with only a 20 year window to get to it, it's already above it. And we're way above this guy uh, because this had to peak at 2020. At, yeah, at uh, our year that we're in currently. So there's an awful lot of suggestion that there's, we're going to be following this track unless we get working on this. Those emissions then translate into these temperature changes. So again, the observed, um, and then the 2.6, the 4.5, and the extreme um, 8.5, predicting up to about 7 degrees here, but as you can see, it, the, the range of uncertainty is large. Okay, so 
that's global. What about the US? We've had a 1.8 degree increase in the US. Um, we're going to get 2.5 regardless of whatever happens because we're on this sort of, it, it, the, the, there's this momentum to it and the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere isn't just going to go away. So that's already projected. And then additional interest increase, additional increases of 3 to 12 are expected by the end of the century depending on what scenario we get. What about Knoxville? This is data from uh, National Weather Service office in Morristown and it's the full record for Knoxville uh, of average annual temperatures and if you fit a model to it it explains 9% of the variation in the data, which is not a lot, but it's significant. And it predicts we're warming at one degree every 100 years, based on that here. But you can see that that's not maybe the best model. So if you try some other type of a model, something that's a little bit more flexible, this is a sort of a quadratic, it can account for this little hump here, and then it kind of goes up here. And then when you look at this range, since 2000, it's predicting that we're warming at one degree every 10 years here. Yeah, at, on average. So one degree every 10 years. Okay, looking overall at the U.S., we've got observed changes in temperature and then projected for the highest RCP. And you can see that Knoxville that sort of fits in with these temperature changes. This is for changes between 86 and 16 relative to 1901 to 1960. We're in this one degree, one to two, de no, zero to one degree range here. And you can see that as we go out to 2100, we're not in the most impacted, but we are in a range that looks to me that it's in this six to seven. Uh, no surprise that it's the North and Alaska, in fact that are the most affected by these changes where they're projecting over eight degrees change. So although Tennessee is not um, in this very extreme range, it's still in a range that's quite impactful. Okay, the fourth key message, rapid Arctic change. Uh, with the warming, we are losing permafrost, it's melting, and we're losing sea ice and glaciers. Um, there's a real concern, as many of you know, that the permafrost, the permafrost contains a lot of stored carbon that can then actually release methane that's coming from the carbon and from the organic matter. Uh, and that can actually accentuate climate change so the CO2, the CO2 and methane released by this thawing can really amplify what's happening. So it's like a feedback effect. We have glacial and sea ice loss expected to continue. And the prediction is that by mid-century, it's very likely that the Arctic will be pretty much free of sea ice, certainly in late summer. And you can see that here couple of pictures from the report. This is the extent in 1984. Um, and this is the extent in 2016, both late summer. And then quantitatively, this is the data on the area in late summer in millions of square miles. Uh, it was a pretty steady trend to quite a reduction over time. Is there any um, evaluation of 
thickness of the ice as well? Yeah. This uh, actually, and it's a very poor quality, is a little inset, I believe, I can't, it's a little, I can't quite remember. I think actually maybe this is age rather than thickness. But, uh, so I don't have that information, but yes, uh, uh, it's probably related to the age. Um, okay, key message number five, US precipitation. So these first two points, the message is that there's actually changes in the distribution. Some areas are getting increases in precipitation, and some areas are getting decreases. And then the projection is that over the next century, there are going to be increases, particularly in spring and winter precipitation in the northern Great Plains, upper Midwest, and northeast. The southeast isn't really going to be affected much by these amounts of precipitation, but it is affected by this aspect, and that's the frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation. So this has increased since the 1950s, and these observed increases are predicted to uh, uh, continue over most parts of the US. So we can see that in this graph. We have the observed and then the projected. And in the observed, these numbers in the black dots basically specify the percentage change so the change from 2016 relative to, to 1958. So in the southeast here, there's been a 27% increase in the total precipitation falling in the heaviest 1% of events. Things are getting more intense in terms of the rainfall. And the projection is that that's going to increase. And certainly, we're in the highest category here. Uh, in eastern Tennessee in terms of a 40-plus change. So we can expect much more intense rainfall events, but the total rainfall amount is not projected to increase much for our area. It's just going to come in fewer and more extreme events. What do they attribute that to? Uh, I haven't studied volume one. <laughs> I'm just presenting the impacts right now. And I'm not a climate scientist. Um, OK, six and seven. If you've got a warming planet, the oceans are going to warm, obviously. And they've observed 93% of the excess heat and a quarter of the extra CO2 that's emitted. And as a result, as you all, many of you know, the oceans are getting warmer, more acidic, which is uh, potentially damaging for organisms that have shells and things like that, um, and then less oxygenated in many locations. And as a result as well, then we have rising sea levels. And this is quite relevant, particularly to today and what's going on with the uh, hurricane activity. So we've already had seven to eight inches since 1900. Almost <laughs> half of that has occurred since 93. Relative to 2000, sea level is likely to rise, now we're talking feet, one to four feet by the end of the century. This is the historical results which are shown here. Again, relative to a post-industrial base line. And we kind of go out here, there's some additional satellite data which are now being incorporated to this point. And then these are projections. If you just take this trend that we're on and extrapolate it out, you would say you're going to get about one foot of change. But then there is these varying degrees of intermediate and extreme projections from the climate models. And if you t sort of take the average and the range possible for the different RCPs, we're in here. So two is probably in this one in the middle. Uh, and as we're already off that. So we have to kind of go up here. Notice that, that it's not much more than two, but now the uncertainty is increasing. And when we go to the extreme, we're certainly over maybe three feet, 
but there's quite possible that we can get up to eight or nine, particularly if large portions of Greenland and various other ice masses all melt, we can get those extreme sea level rises. Okay, more severe storms. Uh, we're already seeing that since 1970 in terms of Atlantic hurricane activity. And the projection is that Atlantic and, and Eastern North Pacific hurricane rainfall and intensity are projected to increase. Because of the increase in the intensity of the storms and the projected increase in sea level rise, it's not surprising there's going to be increases in coastal flooding. That's already occurred since the 1960s. And it's actually quite, dis quite amazing in terms of what's actually being project pr predicted in terms of the frequency and extent of tidal flooding um, associated with um, storms. So let's have a, well actually, I, sorry, I don't have a, a data set for that. We'll look at it in a minute. Let's get to the last message of these key messages, and then we'll look at the southeast with four key points. So the last message is sort of like gather yourself together and try to make some general statements, and that's what you could see that they were doing. Um, Long-term changes. These emission effects are going to persist. Like I told you, we're already going to get those changes because of what we've already done. And they're going to persist for decades to millennia. We can have feedback and self-reinforcing cycles, like I mentioned before, like the massive melting of Arctic ice, like the permafrost melting. And that, that can actually shift us into a quite different climate. And it's very hard to predict for that. In general, climate models are more likely to underestimate than overestimate long-term future changes. And this was their last statement on the last key point, is that future changes outside the rain projected by the climate models cannot be ruled out. That's like a massive change. OK, so let's look at the southeast. And I just want to summarize the main impacts on the climate here. It's kind of interesting. For, for the southeast, we're going to have increasing average summer temperatures, but we're actually going to have fewer daytime temperatures above 95. So the daytime temperatures, the heat of the daytime temperatures, are not predicted to uh, increase. We're actually predicting to a slight decrease. But we're expecting more nighttime temperatures above 75 we're going to have an increasing freeze-free freeze, freeze season. And as you saw earlier, we're going to have greater intense precipitation events. And then for the coastal communities, on le ongoing sea level rise. So I've got four points here and then a, a summary slide to, to finish off. So for the southeast, we have increasing flood risks in the low-lying areas. <clears throat> we have some fairly important growing population, tourist economy, and some critical industries here, and obviously in, uh, cultural resources. The combined effects of those extreme rainfall events and sea level rise are already increasing flood in frequencies. I don't know if any of you listened to um, the local radio station. They were just talking about some of the uh, uh, effects in Charleston in terms of the flooding and how they're planning for, to, to handle those effects. But these are impacting property values and infrastructure their viability. So we have to adapt. Without adaption, we're going <laughs> to, it's hard to believe what that says. These cities are projected to experience daily high tide flooding by 2100. It's, it does say daily. And this is here. This is um, Fort Pulaski, Georgia. And this is high tide flooding in terms of days per year. And this is the observed behavior. This gray line is a linear trend. 
extrapolated out from those data, which would tell us that by 2100, we are at about maybe 75, can't really extrapolate myself, maybe about 75 days per year. But then if you look at these other behaviors, like the extreme trend, or even the ex intermediate pathway, it goes up to, by 2080, it's up to 365 every day. This one gets up to 365 by 2055 every day. Uh, <clears throat> so obviously you can't live with, a, with that type of situation. You have to plan accordingly. So what do they consider a city flooding? I mean, I'm just yeah. envisioning the, the places that are coastal and uh, in some of them, of course, are built right up the beach. Yeah. And Sure. You've got low-lying places where you have a heavy rainfall in a short period of time, and it will flood in that street or that. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, that was. How do they, what are they, how do they I, I, I'm not sure what the definition is, but that's a good point. The story today on Charleston was quite interesting because they were driving around looking at the areas, and obviously there are certain areas that flood more easily than others. Um, and I, I, for this definition, I'm not. I'm not totally sure. I'm, it's probably not total immersion of the entire city. Right. Okay, however, even if it's just a few roads, it's, it's going to impact folks. Okay, urban infrastructure and health risks. This is kind of interesting. Um, because of the changes in the climate, the heat, flooding, then we're actually kind of going to be impacted by vector-borne disease brought about by climate change. And you'll see why that is in a minute. One of these, so what they emphasize is that in the southeast, a lot of the areas are growing rapidly. And because they're growing rapidly, they have the opportunity to adapt in terms of their planning processes for, for uh, dealing with this. And this actually is Charles, some of Charleston's uh, uh, planning. So what they've done is they have a sea level rise strategy and they're looking 50 years out. Um, so like 2065. And what they did was they looked at these projections of sea level rise, basically took the average of them, which is this point here, and then did a box around that with a lower at 1.5 and an upper at 2.5. And so their planning calls for um, 1.5 foot increase, so any kind of vulnerable investments such as parking lots, they're allowing, working with a one point foot projection, and then for any kind of critical infrastructure such as emergency routes and public buildings, um, they're using a two point foot um, increase for, for working with. And so that's in terms of the locations where they're putting buildings in and, and things like that. They're already very active uh, in this. Health risks for the southeast. We have a lot of um, kind of agricultural and forest products industries here. And because of the more frequent heat episodes, particularly at night, for instance, um, <laughs> they're uh, the, um, the climate change is predicted to, uh, to increase health risks and economic vulnerabilities. Uh, this is nationwide, I believe, here. Rather, no, this is actually, excuse me, this is, this is actually for the southeast. By 2100, they're predicting over one half of a billion labor hours could be lost from extreme heat-related impacts. And the worry is that because of the focus on the agricultural industry and also the forest products industry, which many people work out of doors in those uh, areas, that that could negatively impact the labor uh, associated with those industries. This is uh, that projection. 
and this is the percentage drop in hours worked. So the biggest increases are predicted in the Florida area, and East Tennessee were kind of a mix of 2.9 to 3.9 percent change negative. So in terms of hours worked because of the uh, projections, and this is in 2090. Okay, I want to finish off with ecosystems. So we have diverse systems and ecological resources that we use um, are going to be transformed. And I'm going to really show you that right at the end here. We're going to get, we have changing winter temperatures, wildfire patterns, sea levels, hurricanes, floods, and droughts, and the warming ocean temperatures combining. And as a result, we're going to get modified ecosystems. As a result, future generations can expe expect to experience and interact with very different natural systems from those today. Um, from the report, they focus on the expansion of uh, disease-bearing mosquitoes, this Aedes aegypti, and also the expansion of invasive species, and they had a, uh, an example of the Burmese pythons. What I want to do, though, is show you in a very um, visual way. This is not from the report. This is from a paper that came out in Science um, this year. And as you can see, it basically puts contemporary ca climatic analogs for various North American cities. And it's very instructive to look at this. So I'm going to bring it up and we'll have a look and then I'll finish off and answer your questions as best I can. Um, so I want to look for Knoxville. And we'll look. What this does, it looks at the projections and it um, kind of tells you what your climate is going to be like in 2065 with the high emissions. Okay, so with the high emissions right now, um, we are going to be, in 2065, our climate is going to be like the middle of Mississippi. If we just sit here right now and wait until 2065, it'll be, that will be, that's, that's the strongest match but this whole area is sort of going to be sort of compatible. That's the strongest climate similarity. If we change the emissions um, to the 4.5, which is peaking at 2060, we are still we're in Alabama, okay? You have to switch support. Yeah. <laughs> so we just stay here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think this is very instructive. And this is available on that site. And you can, if you've got a hometown that you want to look up, it's particularly. won't be able to win anymore until 2050, is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's, that's the report. If you're interested to look at it, um, this is the, the website. And uh, thank you for your um, uh, questions and attendance. And I'll be glad to try and answer any questions you've got. Um, most of your data seem to be centered around CO2, but we know that yes. Yes. Environmental gas. And yes. The, the big feedlots and so forth. Yeah. Apparently are producing quite a bit of methane. Yeah. Cow farts, et cetera. I agree. Um, was that taken into account in this report? It, there, yeah, sure, there's discussion of it, but I'm, I'm thinking back, and there's not a lot of data, not a lot of quantitative data that are presented. Maybe partly because we don't have long-term measurements of methane over time like that we do ha with, with CO2, I'm speculating. But I can't recall seeing a lot of quantitative data on methane. And we know that, obviously, it's 
a more impactful greenhouse gas than even CO2. That's why the, the permafrost melting and releasing additional methane is, is a really bad feedback effect for us. Yes? Did the report say anything about population movement? Yeah. Yeah, um, it's a very good point. Now, it's it, it is focusing primarily on the U.S. And um, the most of what I recall in terms of population move is a really away from coastal cities. Um, but yes, it deals, they have chapters on all of those aspects. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the computer. So, uh, I don't know if you see, maybe the best way to, to kind of describe this is a little bit like with the hurricane forecasts. I don't know if you've seen those, how they do those. They, they have like a spaghetti model, which, and they kind of, some of them are going out like that, some, and then they basically take an average of those. Well, that's the same for climate forecasting. They have multiple models. And that's how they can kind of get those error bars around them because the projections are, some of them are projecting higher, some of them are projecting lower. And it's fa as a result, I think that's a fairly robust approach, actually, um, because you're, you're dealing with an average and then a confidence level around that average. But now those projections would have used temperature and CO2, which you almost said, only to make those projections. Um, not just temperature. Uh, temperature is actually what's being predicted. They use all of those drivers that I showed you in the first couple of figures, which is information on aerosols, information on CO2. They're very complex. There's some models that are more complex than others, but they include all of the natural drivers as well as the drivers for human activity changes, changes in, um, you know, changes in, um, for instance, the Amazon rainforests, things like that. So land cover, all of those things go in there. But not every model includes everything. So there, that's partly why you get variations. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on some of the best uh, ways to get society to reduce consumption of fossil fuels? Do you have uh, thoughts about that, or do you feel comfortable responding to that? Well. Um, I think education is, that's partly why I wanted to give this talk because I, and partly why I wanted to do the seminar because I think the more people realize what's the effects, then I think that that can provide more of a groundswell for political um, change and also for um, resources to be redirected to other alternatives. And I, I totally agree with Mark about the, the nuclear because I think I can't see us switching totally off greenhouse, uh, totally off fossil fuels without having nuclear a big part of it. And it's something that we can manage. It's yeah, something that we should be able to manage. The adaptability for the base load for the state goes down. But there's a bill, actually, no, there's a bill in Congress right now that's really good if, if we can get that passed. I mean, it, it has been studied and, and shown that it will reduce. Uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions by uh, 2030 uh, up to 50% and 80% by 2050. Yeah, so we've, that's the kind of radical changes that we need. Yeah, it's called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And, and what's so kind of cool about this thing is that the fees they collect for pricing the carbon, internalizing the pollution costs, so to speak, so it gets disseminated back in the form of a dividend to the citizens of the United States. Mm -hmm. so that's, I mean, that yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the bill. So what is the yeah. primary driver of greenhouse gases? Is it fossil fuels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. By how much? Um, I can't put a number on that, but <laughs> certainly it, it, it's it's the primary pri primary. Um, so yeah. Well, no, that's not, that's not true. The increase, it's the increase in the greenhouse gases that's primarily driven by the fossil fuels. There's always greenhouse gases. We always have CO2 in the atmosphere from various different natural sources. 
It's the increase that's, you know, primarily what's driving that. We saw that with the with the modeling. Yeah. Uh, people listening to you understand thanks to you about this. Agree with the assessment report. What do you say to the huge number of people in this country who think that this is all crap? That uh, there is no uh, change going on, or if it is, it's perfectly natural. And don't worry, in 20,000 years, there'll be an ice age and everything else. Well, I, I guess I just um, feel that if we present the data, that uh, opinions will change. Uh, that's, that's my hope. Uh, this is the government's report. It was produced and released in November. It's what the government's saying. So if you don't believe the government, I guess, then maybe uh, you might like to think that it's not very realistic. But look at the amount of people that were involved in it. I mean, 300 leading scientists across the nation Half of them from the government, half of them from uh, from uh, f from academia, universities, research centers, and such. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just an awareness thing. I think people's opinions will change. I think you need to just step outside today. We're already 10 degrees above normal today, and it's going to keep going on. So it, it won't take that long. But we don't have very long either. Uh, we only have 20 years. Basically. So part of your work is separate from this is yeah. in carbon sequestration. Is that in any way a, a partial solution? I mean, obviously it's not a permanent solution. Yeah. Limited on storage capability. Um, yeah, I've done some geologic carbon sequestration work. Um, it, it is a possibility. Um, but it's only one part of the solution. I think it's like any, it's just like with with, um, you know, as we switch energy sources, it has to be part and parcel of, a, of, of other aspects, of reductions in fossil fuels. But yes, that is, that, that is one possibility. Um, and it's probably, the geologic carbon sequestration is probably the most feasible, and even that's still a bit of a stretch, but it's probably the most feasible than a lot of the other options like the atmospheric capture of CO2 um, or pumping it into the ocean and various other things like that. I think the geologic sequestration, it, there are some possibilities for that. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about what Charleston has done to prepare for rising um, yes. increases in flooding? How does that compare to other cities in the United States? And um, what are more rural areas doing, and yeah. Yeah, uh, good question. I, I, from my, I, I don't have a solid answer for that, but from my understanding is that, that Charleston is one of the leading communities because of the nature of their situation, that they're, they're so low-lying that they're, they're being forced into this. I don't know exactly how other coastal communities. Um, I do know that over the last decades, there's been quite a bit of movement to the coast. People like to live at the coast, and unfortunately, that's probably some kind of a trend that we would like to try to discourage as a, as a society. Um, I don't know how we do that, but it's not a, it's not a healthy trend. Um, in terms of the rural areas, obviously, the flooding in the rural areas is going to be primarily related to the increased intensity. And my feeling from the report is that right now, the actual planning for the adaption of that is in a very early stage. There's really not very much investment in changes in, in drainage systems and communities and things like that to, 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 um, you know, to, to offset that. Would you all thank Dr. Perfect.